Well, we're in session 9 of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to explore chapter 13. And again, I want to keep a, the, the broad view in front of us, the design of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, presenting respectively the Messiah, the Servant of God, the Son of Man, and the Son of God, and their genealogies reflecting those themes, the style of the uh, Gospel reflecting that. Matthew, what Jesus said, Mark, what Jesus did, Luke, what he felt, and John, who he actually was. And they, spoke, they had different addressees in mind, Matthew to the Jew, of course, Mark and Luke to the Roman and the Greek, respectively, and John, of course, the church. And the first miracle, the leper, leper cleansed, a very Jewish kind of thing, leprosy denoting sin, like leaven, what have you. Both Mark and Luke speaking to Gentiles, the first thing is a demon expelled. And John is the mystic, the water to wine. And there's much behind that that we won't get into here. But the end of each one reflects that same theme. Matthew, the resurrection. Mark, the ascension. Luke, the promise of the Holy Spirit, which of course sets up a sequel to the book of Acts, or Luke chapter 2, Luke uh, volume 2. And John sets up his sequel, the book of Revelation. And uh, all of these are reflected by the faces of the cherubim around the throne of God or the ensigns that surround the tabernacle in, in the camp of Israel. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the ox is the symbol of service, the son of man, and the eagle. But, uh, so we're go going through this perspective for the Gospel of Matthew and we went through section 1 which had four chapters, the genealogy, the birth, and the baptism of temptation of Jesus Christ and then climaxed with the manifesto of Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. That was the first major section of the book. Section 2, we had the coming of the storm, the demonic, the call of Matthew. And uh, then we had these two incidences that were linked, strangely. Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. Then the twelve were sent out. We had a John the Baptist issue in chapter 11. And then we finished last time with chapter 12, the Sabbath issues and the unpardonable sin. But chapter 12 closes off section 2, the major section of the book. And um, it's the end of an important section. It ended with the, presenta ended the pre presentation of the kingdom to Israel. And the rejection of Jesus Christ did not begin at the cross. It started in chapter 12, when they ascribed his miracles to Satan. And one will note that Jesus from this point on will shift gears. Very dramatically, it's a very strange ways. He will only speak publicly in parables for some very surprising reasons. It may surprise you. So we're at this turning point. The kingdom parables, as they're often called, in Matthew 13. We're going to take a look at the structure of the chapter because we're going to take a few pieces of, out of order. It'll be a little simpler. The first few verses are going to talk about the sower and four soils, a very familiar passage to most of us. Then Jesus is going to talk a little bit about why does he speak in parables? He's going to counsel his disciples about on that matter. Then he's going to explain that first parable, the sower and the four soils. He'll explain that one. He's also going to give them another one, tares and the wheat. And then he's going to give one about the mustard seed and the woman and leaven. The, you'll notice that the parables... The first, second, third, fourth, so are given in public. The explanation of the parables are given to the disciples in private, and we'll see why in a minute. Because he continues when after the woman eleven verses thirty four to thirty five, again he continues his discussion of why is he speaking in parables. Then he gives, uh, and then he also explains the tares and the wheat, the second parable. So he's given them four parables by then, but he, will, he, he holds the tares and the wheat till the end. Then he gives them a few more, Tre treasure in the field, the pearl of great price, and the dragnet. Now, what I want to do here is, um, you notice that the sower and the four soils and the explanations are, are separate. We're going to put them together. And we're going to start by looking at these explanations he inserts as to why does he speak in parables in the first place. That's in two segments, if you will. Tares and the wheat. We're going to take the tares and the wheat and the explanation of it together. Do you follow me? So you can read the chapter in sequence, but we're going to, we're going to explore it in a, in, a, in a what may be a more useful way to get it across. Another way to look at this, you see that the parables, uh, we're going to take that right up front. And um, the sower and the four soils, we're going to take that right after the sower and the four soils and the explanation of the tares and the wheat right with the tares and the wheat. Do you, get, you follow me? 
So we're going to just take them, in, we're going to take all the verses, but we're going to take them in a different order. So we'll start looking at Matthew 13, starting, we're going to take verses 10 through 17 and 34 through 35, which is a little side discourse to the disciples, which explains why is he speaking in parables. That's our first topical segment here, okay? The disciples came and said to them, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now they're saying this in verse 10, but we want to look at it first so we can understand what's all going on here. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given to, unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Gee, I thought parables were little ways to teach. I thought parables were, was to, a way of getting you to understand. No, it's just the opposite. The parables are so that they, unless they have the Holy Spirit, won't understand. And he said, Chuck, that's pretty weird. Wait a minute, I just said, he said that. Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. For whosoever, whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. Wow, what on earth, what is that double talk? You'll discover from several places in Scripture, but just cut through it here, the Lord will give you some truth, and you'll see what you do with that truth. If you deal with it, he will give you some more. If you reject it, he'll even take away that which he's given you. In other words, it's, it's a courtship. It's a courtship. But Jesus goes on, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, oh, excuse me, uh, let's take a snapshot from Paul's comment in a similar vein in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul is in his Thessalonian letter, chapter 5, says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. So remember, remember, he'd been there for three weeks and taught them what they knew and went on and wrote them letters later, First and Second Thessalonians. He says, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Hold that thought, because most people misunderstand what he's saying. For yourselves, for yourselves know perfectly, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. What you realize when you read the whole passage is what Paul is saying back there in verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night to those who are in darkness. Not you guys, because you're in the light. You follow me? He's creating a contrast here. For those that are in darkness, those that are in light. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night to those who are in darkness. That's really what he's implying here. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh on them as a traveler upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that, over, that day should overtake you as a thief. You realize what Paul is saying? That if you're a believer, you will not be caught by surprise. Don't misunderstand me. We're not setting dates here. But the real believer will meet the Lord in an atmosphere of expectation. That's what he expects us to do. He continues, Ye are all children of light. And children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a precious promise. Verse 9 is a very key promise. The church is promised not to experience the wrath of God. The people in the tribulation will experience the wrath of God. My proof of that is Revelation chapter 6, where they fear the wrath of the Lamb, who is able to stand, and so on. Okay? Let's get back to Matthew. Jesus says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. He's quoting from Isaiah 42. 
Hear ye deaf, and look ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf is my messenger that I sent? Who is blind is he that is complete or perfect, and blind is the Lord's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening ears, but he heareth not. He said, Go and tell his people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes. And hear with their ears. And understand with their heart. And convert and be healed. Boy. Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. This is, echoes, in a sense, this whole idea of casting pearls before the swine. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet, oh, excuse me, uh, this is, I'm uh, uh, taking the thought here from John. I usually try to mark that. To, we're, I'm, I've shifted for a moment from Matthew 12 to John 12. It's a very interesting passage here that echoes the same thing we just read, but it has another little surprise for you. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, saying, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord be revealed? Those words may be familiar to you because they come from the opening stanzas of Isaiah 53, right? Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and so on. The next verse says, Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Well, I think you recognize that this verse here is, echoes the same thought we've just expressed, that Jesus just expressed, but here he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. Now, it happens, um, that's the reason I wanted to extract this, but when I extracted this to put in here, I wanted to include another little surprise. I, one of my favorite verses is verse 40. It says, they could not believe because, see, he's quoting Isaiah, Isaiah 6 here, because that Isaiah said again. The verse before this one, verse 38, is quoting from Isaiah 53. Verse 40, he's quoting from Isaiah 6, right? You with me so far? I want you to notice verse 40 says, that Isaiah said again. Jesus here has just saved you hours of boring library research, chasing down this idea that there were two Isaiahs. The common thing taught in seminaries, well, there's really two Isaiahs, Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2 and so forth. And I won't go down that path. It's superficially appealing only to the people who don't understand how the book of Isaiah is organized, that don't really understand the style, and a bunch of other things. Saving you all that trouble, Jesus told you the same Isaiah wrote Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. The guy that wrote Isaiah 53 is the guy that wrote Isaiah 6. That little verse, verse 40, is a treasure. When I was a, 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 a very, very enthusiastic teenager, studying my Bible, falling in love with it, I encountered the documentary hypothesis of Graf Wellhausen, the J-E-P-Q, you know, the different authors that really wrote the book of Torah and all that stuff. I also got in this whole, uh, these papers about how Isaiah is really written by two different guys who called themselves Isaiah. And, and I didn't really buy it, but the, that still, it plants a doubt that be becomes like a, a weed that grows in your, in your background. And I'm so, so grateful for being able to shred that garbage with <laughs> coats like this. It's just very, very, very pleasant. Let's move on. Uh, he's continuing the quote, but for this people's heart is waxed gross and their eyes are dull of hearing, their eyes that they be closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. So he's finishing the quote from Isaiah and he says, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears, for they hear. Jesus is talking to his disciples here in private. I hope he's also talking to you. I hope, it is, I hope your eyes are blessed that they see and that your ears, for they hear. If you do, let me tell you, it's not an intellectual thing. It's not because you're smart. 
It's not because I'm an effective presenter, any kind of nonsense. The only reason you'll be blessed with your eyes and, and see, or with your ears here, is because the Holy Spirit makes it possible. It's the Holy Spirit makes it possible. Let's never forget that. I always get nervous when we go on these trips, especially people come up to me and, and express their gratitude for our ministry and this, that, and the other thing. And I try to receive that as welcome encouragement. But um, I do so with great risk um, because I don't ever want to take myself seriously. I'm surrounded by some loyal staff members that have sworn that if I ever start taking myself seriously, they will plant their boot where it belongs. Right? <laughs> anyway, Jesus continues, Matthew 13, For verily I say unto you, when Jesus wanted to, to, to emphasize something, he'd say, I say unto you such and so. When he really wanted to emphasize it, he would say, verily I say unto you. He said, for verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. All these things spake Jesus unto them, unto the multitude, in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. He didn't just speak in parables publicly. That's the only way he spoke publicly from chapter, 12 on, or chapter 13 on. And in typical Matthew, he always, fill, he always uh, laces this with the quotes from the Old Testament. That it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. This phrase, foundation of the world, how many times does it show up in the New Testament? Anyone want to make a guess? Seven, exactly. That's right. It turns out you can check it out with your concordance. Very interesting. But I want you to notice there's a statement here that is extremely profound. It says, Jesus says, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. The subject of these 13 parables are not to be found in the Old Testament. These aren't colorful little illustrations of truths that were in the Old Testament. These are things, they deal with things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That means these are, topics are not in the Old Testament. That's a key uh, perception. It's, it's what I call an architectural phrase. It's a clue to how this thing's, how the whole Bible's organized. There's a chunk coming here that is fresh, new, not in the Old Testament. We find this same thing claimed by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. That's your cross-reference for this. Paul had the unspeakable privilege of revealing something, or Lord revealed through him, something that most people still to this day do not understand. Paul says, Whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as is now revealed unto us holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what, what is this thing that is so... You know, what, what are we talking about here? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Don't assume what he's saying is that the, the mystery here is that Gentiles can be saved. Because that's all through the book of Isaiah. We read that a few verses ago. There's something deeper going on here. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This opens the door to a field of study called ecclesiology, study of this church in its mystical sense. When people argue about, does the church go through the tribulation? That's a common topic among es eschatological discussion groups and so forth. When those discussions occur, it will reveal two shortcomings. A lack of understanding of eschatology is not the biggest one. The lack of ecclesiology. If you understand what the church is, and if you understand what the tribulation is from the scripture, you'll realize they are mutually exclusive for lots of reasons. I challenge you with that to do your own study. But that's, 
that, that's an excerpt. We went through chapters 10 through 17, uh, verses 10 through 17 and 34 to 35. With that background, now let's go now in and see these parables he's giving them. We're going to take the first one, which is sower and four soils, which show up verses 3 to 9. And then we'll skip down to verses 18 through 23, where he explains that particular passage. And there are no surprises here. It's been well preached on by many. I'm sure you've heard it many, many times. Matthew 13, starting about verse 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Pay attention to these birds. They're going to show up later on. And you're going to, in a surprising way. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up and they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. That's the second of the four, right? Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. That's the third one. The fourth one is, the other fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, does that phrase evoke any memories in you? Do you realize that peculiar phrase obviously occurs seven times in Revelation 2 and 3? It closes each of the seven letters of seven churches, right? How many other times does it appear in the New Testament? First guess does, the only one counts. Seven. It fascinates me that you'll find this phrase seven times in the Gospels separate from the seven times in the book of Revelation. You can make a big thing of that if you like or not. It's up to you. I'll leave that to, to, uh, to you. Now we're going to sk skip down to verse 18 where Jesus is now going, they're, they're now in private and he's going to explain that first parable, right? He says, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Got the picture. The first situation was seed by the wayside, and the fowls came and caught it away, right? What were those fowls representing metaphorically? When one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. See, that's your adversary. You, you may hear the word of God, but if you don't grasp it, you don't grab it, Satan will find a way to snatch it away from you. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. That's loser number one. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy received it, and yet he hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. And when the tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. These are people that have a, su a superficial surface enthusiasm, but no real depth of study. These are people that may be in a denominational context that think that going to church frequently on Sunday morning is all you need to do. They don't engage the Word of God with a zest and an appetite, a hunger, to have set down deep roots. Many Christians have very shallow roots. They don't dig into the Bible, certainly not the Old Testament. They got this notion that it was superseded by the New. They don't understand it's a package deal. He that received the seed among the thorns is that he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and becomes unfruitful. This is someone who's received it, but he's too entangled in the word, word, excuse me, in the world. The care of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. There's nothing wrong with being rich as long as it doesn't become the God you worship. We've had the privilege of knowing some very, very wealthy people that are, you would not find people that are more in love with the Lord God. There's nothing wrong with riches. It's the deceitfulness of riches when they become your, your goal and, and, and your master. They choke the word. That is, they squeeze it out of your schedule. And they, of course, then become unfruitful if they, if they don't go. He that received the seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. 
which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I've always been intrigued by that sequence. Hundred, sixty, thirty. You get the impression that the yield is going to decline to apostasy eventually. That's what Laodicea is all about, I think. So, so we had wayside without understanding, the birds steal the seed away. Stony places without root, they fail under pressure. Those among thorns are too entangled in the cares of this world. These are the three losers. The winner is the good ground that hear it and understand it and do it, bear fruit. Okay, so much. Th this one is not full of many surprises because it's been preached on by it's very popular sermon material, and it's pretty hard to go wrong with that particular thing. Um, let's go to the, let, uh, that. So that one's explained. Great for that. Let's move on to the next one. Tares in the wheat. That'll be verses 24 through 30, and we'll pick up the explanation from verse 36 to 43, where Jesus will exp he'll ex Jesus will explain these first two. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came, and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up, and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And uh, Zenzania is what we're talking about here. This is a seed in Palestine today that looks just like wheat, except it's black. And if you mix it with wheat, it's poisonous. And so uh, it gets, it, it, if, you make bread, try to, if you make bread with it, and the, some of those seeds get into the bread, it turns out to be toxic. You've got to separate them out. Okay? That's what we're dealing with here. Well, the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not, now, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? The first presumption is he had a quality control problem in the seed that he bought. No, no, he said. He said to them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said to him, wilt thou then that we go up and gather them up? He said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. The presumption I think we can make is that when they're grown, they're more distinguishable, and it's easier to take a pass through the field and get the bad stuff out of there before you harvest. And that's uh, the, the, the concept here. So we get to verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away. Notice these explanations are in private, not to the public. Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He that soweth good seed is what? The Son of Man. You notice, something else I want, I want you to notice here, it's called among scholars the, the principle of expositional constancy. That's just a fancy word for saying the idioms by the Holy Spirit tend to be consistent. The field in all of these is the world. The sower is the Son of Man. The seed is the Word of God. That's true in the first parable. It's also true in the second. You follow me? Okay. And... Uh, the field is the world, there it is. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. <whistles> Boy. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. That's pretty straightforward. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Oh boy. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. There's that phrase again. Don't assume that this is talking about the rapture. That's not gathering the evil ones. This is talking about the second coming in power. Understand, the Jews had two views. Of the, they couldn't reconcile two messiahs the Mashiach ben Yosef and the Mashiach ben David, the suffering servant and the reigning king. There was going to be two, many, they still talk today of two messiahs. They didn't realize it's the same guy coming back twice, all right? We make the same mistake as Christians, some of us. Christ is coming back twice, once to gather his church and another to fulfill the commitments to Israel. 
And when he sets up his kingdom, that's what it's talking about here. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, we had that one explained. Let's move on to the next one. This one is not explained. Simple little parable. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. I've heard people preach this, that the, the, the Word of God is, is like a very small seed, but planted that will grow to take over the whole world. That's a problem here, because if you've ever been to Israel, you see, especially at this time of year, you see the, the, uh, he, the uh, hills covered. They're very green this time of year, but they're covered with these yellow flowers, with bushes that are about, what, one, two, three feet high max. That's the wild mustard. And it's a very small seed, and of course it's a great herb. It grows wild there. But this one that he's talking about here becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come to lodge the branches of it. Well, that's a problem because have you ever seen a bird make a nest in a bush that's three feet high? Not very often. No, what the implication here is that this is a monstrosity. It's grown to become a tree so comfortable, so to speak, that the birds of the air lodge in its branches. Now, who are the birds of the air? Do you remember from the ministers of Satan? Yes. Oh, that gives this thing a very different complexion. If you're going to preach on this, it's not going to be a very popular topic. It implies that the, that the church is going to grow into a monstrosity, and if you're looking for the ministers of Satan, don't overlook its pulpits. Boy. Well, we'll make some cross-checks on this before we go. Let's, take, let's go to the next one. Jesus didn't explain number three. Let's take number four, the woman and the leaven. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, you and I as Gentiles can't relate to that. That sounds okay. You heard, you've probably heard uh, uh, ministers speak, the kingdom of heaven is again like, like it put a little in there and pretty soon the whole thing, everything's going to be wonderful. The problem with that is that leaven is always used in the Old and New Testament as an idiom of sin. Hypocrisy, deceitfulness. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Jesus says several occasions. Leaven is bad news. Anybody that celebrated Passover knows the ritual they go through to get the leaven out of the house. They hide a little, let the kids find it and give a prize. You know, they make a whole thing of getting the leaven out of the house. Oh, I meant to bring a, a package of matzah last year celebrating a Passover. Uh, the, 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 at our little fellowship, they passed out little boxed packages of matzah. And I took this home, and I looked at the label. And I called the rabbi. And he says, I can't use this. He says, why, why, what's the matter? What, what, why? It's, you know, it's from New York, and so it's, it's official stuff, you know? I says, because I looked at the label. There's a big label on it. He says, packed with pride for 35 years. <laughs> And he caught it immediately. It cracked him up. You never noticed that. He said, he's going to have fun with that with his other rabbinical friends. <laughs> now, leaven, leaven is idiomatically used as sin because it corrupts by puffing up. It was through pride that sin first entered in. Leaven is an elegant metaphor for sin, right? A little bit corrupts the whole bunch and, and so forth. You follow, you see, so... But here now, three measures of meal in the Jewish community is suggestive of the fellowship offering. It echoes from um, Isaiah 19, where the three, where the Lord and two angels visit Abraham. And he hurriedly has Sarah put together three measures of meal for, the, for that visitation, the Lord and two angels, three measures of meal. So it becomes, in the Arabic as well as Jewish cultures, the fellowship offering. But here it's like, this, this is now, with that background, see, if you're Jewish and you're reading this, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was You gasp in horror. You're supposed to be unleavened. Do you follow me? It was done in haste, see? So here again, we have that same sort of, there's a, there's a gloomy cloud over everything. What is he really saying here? Let's move on to the next one. 
Treasure in the field. Well, this one's pretty straightforward. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hid in a field. In the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, right? That everybody in the world is going to be saved? No. That whosoever believeth on him shall be saved. The treasure of those that believe in him is enough for him to have paid for the whole world. Get the picture? Pretty elegant. Who's doing the buying here? You and me? No. No. This is, your sermon speaks that way. No, no. The man that uh, 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 sells everything, gives, every, gives everything he has for that field is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He emptied himself. And then we get to this one really fascinates me, the pearl of great price. Sounds like the same thing, but it's not. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. When he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now this is kind of interesting because here's a rabbi talking to Jewish listeners. Oysters are not kosher. They're prohibited in the Torah. So what are they doing here talking about pearls? The Jews did not prize pearls because they were not kosher. They may have traded in them with Gentiles to make money, yes, but they didn't, they, they, it was a commercial thing. It wasn't a devotional thing. And, uh, but here is a pearl. Why would Jesus use a pearl as an idiom here? Well, it's the only jewel that grows from an irritation. And it is removed from its place of growth to become an item of adornment. Oh, what an elegant metaphor for the church. It, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When he found a pearl of great price, he went and sold all the had and bought it. He's using, it, this, is, this is not only an idiom of the church, a Gentile jewel, but one that grows by accretion a little grain of sand that the oyster then keeps growing, make a pearl out of it. And uh, then you, when you find it, you take it out of its place of growth to become an item of adornment. Elegant, elegant model. Okay. Now, uh, pre preaching a Jewish sermon from this one is a tough one. Because it's not, it's Gentile. And then we've got the last one, which is pretty straightforward. In fact, I'm going to call, check it as explained because he explains it when he gives it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net which was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the cast, he, they cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth, sever the wicked from among the just, shall cast them in the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Boy, boy. Now, this is the one place, one of the several times, that I really get frustrated with the disciples. Jesus said unto him, Have you understood all these things? And I suspect they lied to him. Yea, Lord, yeah, we understood. I wish, I wish they'd had the character to say, Gee, could you explain the other, you know, four? We've got three of them pretty well because you've explained those. There are four. Lord, don't you understand? The library is going to be filled with speculations. Would you please explain those four and say, no. Oh, yeah, we understood them all. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, right? Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth of his treasure things new and old. Well, let's talk a little bit about something else. If you've been through Revelation 2 and 3, you know that there are seven churches that the Lord selected to be representative of all churches. And uh, they have a local, there were actual churches in those days that had problems and they had a local application. They also had an admonitory application to all churches to understand the theme of each one of these and the good news and the bad news, because there are seven report cards. And... Uh, then there's a third level, personally. He that hath to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church says. All churches were to get all letters, and everybody in those churches are to, to learn from those lessons. So we've got three levels there. Local, admonitory, homiletic. 
There is a fourth level, prophetic. It turns out that these seven churches lay out a history of the church. If they were in any other order, it wouldn't be true. And uh, so if you study each one of these letters, you'll discover the name of the letter, the title that Jesus selects of himself from chapter 1 to use as an identity is, is, fits the letter. There's a, there's a, it's a report card. Some good news, some bad news, some exhortation. And then the, uh, a promise to the overcomer. And then the strange closing phrase, he that hath an ear. And I'll, I won't try to recap the whole study of Revelation 2 and 3. I encourage you to go through that. But uh, it turns out that uh, the first one is generally recognized, most commentators, as expressive of the apostolic church. Very, very diligent on doctrine. They tried them who were say the apostles or not. Found them liars. But they failed in that they lost their first love. They were long on doctrine but short on devotion. And that was the way Jesus Christ. What's interesting about all seven is every one of the seven churches apparently was surprised by their report card. Two of them had nothing good said about them. Two of them had nothing bad said about them. And that's worth understanding as you go through. For Smyrna, the word Smyrna means myrrh. It speaks of persecution and death. It's the persecuted church, indeed. And uh, it's the one that has nothing bad said. The Lord just says, hey, hang in there. You're doing fine. And... Uh, the next one is the married church. Bigamy is married to two, mono, married to one. Pergamus is married perver per perversely. P Pergamus is the married church, married to the world. Under Constantine and his successors, the church, that le not only was Christianity made legal, illegally, legal, but uh, the second leader after C Constantine Theodosius made it the state religion. And suddenly the church was a political uh, entity filled with unregenerates, and that was what Satan could not accomplish by persecuting the church, he accomplished by getting it entangled with the world, something they haven't yet to recover from. And uh, from this, of course, comes the medieval church with a woman Jezebel, the queen of heaven, and all of that emphasis. And, uh, and, uh, and if that's the Vatican, then the next one is the Reformation. Sardis, I'll, I'll call the denominational church. You have, you have a name, but you're dead. And uh, if uh, the, the Protestant commentators have had a field day with Thyatira, tying it to the Vatican by a number of different ways, but with some legitimacy, well, if that's the case, Sardis is the Reformation church, and Sardis is one of the two letters that has nothing good said about it. You have a name, but you are dead. That's the indictment of Sardis. After Sardis comes the missionary church. This is the one that's promised to be delivered from the, the, uh, the uh, tribulation. And uh, it's the one that has nothing bad said about it. And then we have Laodicea, the final apostate, apostate church. If you understand these seven letters, you can profile every church has elements of all seven in each of them, in different proportions. If you understand the seven, you can profile any church. And you'll also have a profile of the history of the church and its challenges in each era. Well, having said all that, let's take a look at these seven churches that were letters dictated by the Lord Jesus. And let's compare that with the kingdom parables, which I submit to you are somehow profiling the church also. Some of these are pretty obvious. Some take a little study. Let's take the simple ones. The word Pergamos, notice they, they line up. This is the, each these order they're both presented in. Pergamos is the church that married the world, right? The mustard seed outgrows just being a bush and becomes a tree, so the ministers of Satan lodge in its branches. Is that descriptive of the era that is characterized by Pergamos, where the church marries the world and fills its uh, pulpits with hirelings from the state of the state, and so on and so forth? That's kind of interesting. Thyatira is the one that has the woman Jezebel and the false doctrine and so forth. And the fourth kingdom parable is the woman and the leaven, putting her leaven in that soon leaveneth the whole lot. You see that the parallels there are pretty conspicuous. Let's take another one that's pretty easy to look at. Philadelphia is the church that's promised that it will be raptured, taken out of the, will not see the hour of a trial that's coming upon the earth. The pearl is a gem that grows by accretion but then is removed from its place of growth to become an item of adornment. I think the parallels are rather provocative. I'll leave it to you 
to examine carefully each of the seven letters and each of the seven parables and decide for yourself whether it's a fit or not. Some of them take a little bit of study. But if that's the case, let me, I, I was very fascinated by that parable because I personally think the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit are on both of those in, in, in spades, so to speak. But Paul's epistles are pretty interesting. We've got Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right on through. We're, I'm going to ignore Hebrews because Paul did not sign it for some very good reasons. But these are the epistles that are typically attributed to, clearly signed by Paul. It's interesting that three of them are written to pastors. Or I should say written to three pastors. There's four epistles written to three pastors. First and second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon were pastors. That means out of ten addressees, there are seven churches. Well, now that's interesting. Paul wrote seven churches. A couple of them he wrote double letters to. That's okay. Let's, let's explore this a little bit. Is there a... Uh, uh, let's take, let's go look at the, the, uh, the uh, um, seven letters, seven churches. The first one's Ephesus. That one's pretty straightforward. Paul wrote a letter to Ephesus. Smyrna. Is there a letter that Paul wrote that speaks of joy through suffering? Anyone? Philippians? Sure. The kenosis and all of that. Bergamus. Is there a letter that is written to the worldly church. Sure. There was a figure of speech on the street of an adulterer. It was called a Corinthian. That was, that was synonymous with a fornicator. The Corinthians. Thyatira. The original name of Thyatira was Semiramis. Is there a letter that is written to that? And I'm going to suggest to you that's Galatians. Sardis, I'm going to suggest, is Romans. Philadelphia is the rapture church and the, the Thessalonian letters, first and second, are the two of the most important eschatological epistles in the New Testament. And that leaves you one left, Laodicea. There are phrases in the Greek that occur only in Laodicea and Colossians, figures of speech, but also Colossians was, was one mile from Laodicea. They were virtually suburbs of one another and they were instructed to exchange letters. So now this fascinates me because I wouldn't call Paul a mystic. He was a practical guy writing practical letters trying to put out fires to the church, to the practical problems the churches were facing in that era. But if there is a parallel between these two, as I think there is, then that's a fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. I submit to you. Okay. So we've gone through a quick summary of Revelation, of Revelation 2 and 3, but also chapter 13. For your next session, I'd like you to read chapters 14 and 15. Uh, for the next time, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.